Youth group? Yeah, Graydon's here. You may dis be dismissed. He's outside. I can see him through the window. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning to those watching online. I know that some of you are watching. You've texted me. And in saying that, Glory, if you're watching right now, is the camera angle okay? Do we still need to move in? I don't know if you can move it, Kevin, or not, but... <laughs> I don't know if it was for the worship. Sometimes for worship, the camera's just fo focused on the screen and not Dustin, because we don't want to... We want to focus on Jesus, not Dustin. No. <laughs> Just joking. Well, I mean, it's serious, but. <laughs> um, so Matthew chapter 4, and that's where we're at this morning. Saint, Satan tempts Jesus. In the New King James, that's what they titled this chapter. They're correct. And I've been pondering this chapter for like three weeks. And last night... Someone broke into the church, the Fellowship Hall. Our church has been broken in, our church has been broken in like three times this last year. And it's a bummer because we believe it's the same guy. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was like 12 o'clock at night. <laughs> yeah, we think he took Joe's men's retreat shirt. <laughs> But Dustin got a notification, because we have cameras here on the property, and so Dustin came here and, and then called the police, and they came here and cleared the building. And, and so let's, before we start the study, we'll pray for him that the Lord will just weigh heavy on him, you know, because he, he took some things. He took a laptop, and he took our first place softball trophy. Oh, that's <laughs> I know! You were on that team! I know. On the cam it's defeating, because on the camera, he's like walking out, and he's just... Like, I was like, man. So. I know. I got to inspire our church team now. Got to bring it home this, this season. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be messed up. <laughs> so we'll pray for him. I mean, it's just, I mean, me and Tim were talking about it. I mean, the Lord, he owns the Bible says cattle on a thousand hills, and he owns the hills too. So God's not, it's when, he, when people come in and they, and they steal a laptop or they steal stuff, it's, it's, they're stealing from the Lord and, and the Lord can replenish that stuff. I just, I'm more concerned for that guy. Um, he also took, we have a huge nativity set for the children, and he took Mary and put her in the bathroom. And Charlie brought up a good point because he's like, he, you know, you know, some religions highly regard Mary, so was he like, Mary, you can't see what I'm about to do. Because it was weird. Like, he removed Mary and put her in the women's bathroom. So, it was really weird. So, we'll pray for him. But, you know, I'm just, I've been contemplating this chapter about the enemy. Jesus, in John chapter 10, said the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And these individuals that come and, and steal from the church, I mean, it is the enemy. And, and so, we're praying that the Spirit of the Lord would be heavy on him. And that he would return the stuff, that he would get right with the Lord. It'd be awesome. I, I tell you, I know me and Charlie, like if this guy came and wanted to return the stuff, we would witness to him. We, we would, we would uh, give him the gospel. Uh, we have our church, like 10 years ago, someone broke in and took computers in this building and took tithe money. We prayed for them, and they came back the next week. They didn't, we didn't see them in person, but they dropped all the stuff off in the breezeway, all the money, the change, and everything. So the Lord definitely works on these guys' hearts. So... Let's pray for him. Let's pray for him, and then we'll get into this study. Glorious and thank you. Awesome. Praise God. Let's pray. Lord, we just uh, thank you for today. Um, Lord, we just love you so much. We thank you for this season, the season we always think and ponder and remember when you came to this planet 2,000 years ago, Lord, um, the virgin birth, Lord, Emmanuel, God with us. We thank you that you're the greatest missionary that has ever lived, that you came, Lord, because you loved us so much that you wanted to die on the cross for us so that if we believed in you, we could not perish but come to repentance, Lord. So uh, we thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for the season. I pray for that individual, Lord, that broke in last night. Together as a body, the body of Christ, Lord, we pray together right now for him. He's out there somewhere. Um, and we, we just pray that your spirit would just weigh heavy upon him, Lord. Um, most importantly, to get to, you know, to, to repent and to get to know you, Lord. 
uh, first and foremost, Lord. And if you want that stuff returned, God, uh, we would like that, but that's up to you, Lord. We know that you can replace just materialistic things. You, you have so much resources at your fingertips, Lord. So, But first and foremost, we pray for him, Lord, that there be true conviction, Lord. I do pray, Lord, that if you want to bring him here, I know that me and Charlie, Lord, we would love to present you to him, Lord, to talk to uh, him about you. So uh, we lift that situation to you, God, and uh, and we ask for the service continually, Lord, that as we continue to read your word in Matthew chapter 4, that you would just inspire it by your Holy Spirit and help us to understand uh, your word. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. So it's just a weird, it's just weird when people break in. It's a weird violation of the church. I don't know, I'm 40 years old, but I feel like I'm, I guess, old enough now that when I grew up... <laughs> It was kind of like taboo to mess with a church or a relig religious organization. It's pretty bold for someone to come in. Gil, they took our American flag down over there, and they, they pulled off the top eagle, like the ornament, and they must have chucked it in the parking lot because Denise found it by her uh, truck. No. Yeah, so even that, just very strange. Yeah. <laughs> Matthew chapter 4. Matthew, last week, revealed to us the dramatic coronation of Jesus Christ. His crowning is a crowning moment where when he was baptized that the heavens were ripped open. Literally, just God the Father cracked open the heavens, the sky, and the Holy Spirit came down like a dove upon Jesus and rested upon him. And we heard the Father's voice say to Jesus at his baptism, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. What a great declaration of who Jesus is. In the book of John, the disciple John, he recorded that, the, that the John the Baptist said that at that moment when the Holy Spirit came on Jesus, that he knew that indeed Jesus was the Son of God. It confirmed that to him. John also reveals to us that John the Baptist was told by God, if you read it in John chapter 1, that he was actually told by God that when he baptizes the Messiah, that he would know that it's the Son of God, that he was Messiah by the Spirit of God descending on him. So he had that special insight. We read about that last week, that Jesus affirmed the baptism that John was preaching, the repentance that we must believe and repent of our sins and turn our lives over to God. And Jesus affirmed that and confirmed it, went through baptism himself. He didn't need to be baptized. He was perfect and without sin, but he identified with man. And as soon as he comes out of the water, chapter 4, verse 1, if you're there with me, reading from the New King James this morning, it says, Then Jesus was led up by the Holy Spirit, the Spirit, into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And this is unique. And the Bible kind of lays out from Genesis to Revelation that whenever there's a great move of God, a work of God, a blessing of God, you often have opposition right after that. And we're going to see that pattern continue into chapter 4. That just a great blessing and outpouring that God affirms like who, that Jesus is his son. It's this great moment. And then immediately you're going to see that he's led up into the wilderness to be tempted. This is determined. This wasn't by an accident when Jesus goes up to the wilderness to be tempted or tried by the devil, this isn't by accident. This is determined, and I believe for two reasons, which we'll see this morning. Number one, to show us that Jesus is the Son of God and that he overcomes sin, or that he overcomes evil. He can overcome temptation. He is divine. He is the Son of God. And number two, to identify with you and I. Because Hebrews, which I'll read later, the author tells us that Jesus was tempted just like you and I are, and that he can sympathize with us in our weakness and in our temptation. And so those are the two main reasons why Jesus is led up. But we see opposition after a great move of God. Mark tells us that Jesus immediately, I mean, Mark like puts a stamp of like, he goes straight out into the wilderness. And it doesn't say that the spirit led him. He uses the word, dri dr he, he was drove. He was drove out into the wilderness. Um, this was his mission to go out there and confront the devil to be tempted in the wilderness. So when he's there, it says in verse 2, he fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterward he was hungry. So being led up by the Spirit, he fasted for 40 days. And I, and I do have a question, and I read a lot of commentaries and listen to a lot of teachings and, uh, before I teach on chapters. And, 
And I just think there's some things that aren't revealed, so we don't know. I don't know if Jesus knew that he was going to be there for 40 days, or because we're going to talk about that here in a second, um, because he's going to get super hungry here, which obviously, I mean, if you've ever been on a keto diet or if you've ever gone a few days without having food, uh, you get hungry pretty quick, just a couple days with no food. But you're going to see here that when he's tested, he's very hungry at the end, and it looks like he's waiting for the Father to break his fast. He's waiting. It looks like he's waiting for the Lord to let him know, okay, you know, this, this trying's done. Uh, you can eat now. But we'll, we'll, we'll cover that in a second here. Forty days. This isn't something that's new that comes on the scene. Uh, we see Moses in Exodus chapter 34 when he was on Mount Sinai. It says that he went 40 days without food and drink. Forty days. So he also fasted uh, for that long, supernatural. Uh, the Lord provided for him, revealed to him ten commandments on that mountain, Mount Sinai. In 1 Kings chapter 19, Elijah, the prophet, he fasted for 40 days. Uh, he, he knew that Jezebel was after him. It's a pretty interesting story. And Elijah was told by an angel, like, you need to eat like this super packed lunch that's packed with a bunch of calories and just really good food because you have to, you're going to go on a long journey. And it says that he was gone for 40 days and 40 nights. We see the children of Israel, they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. We see Noah's ark as well. And so usually the word 40 is tied together with trying or testing. And so Jesus is going out there for this trying, this testing time, and afterwards he becomes hungry, and no doubt he would. And I took some time to really kind of look at starvation because that's really what this is. Now, he, he didn't go out there to starve, but after fasting for this long, uh, starvation was kicking in. I guess I don't want to get ahead of myself here. He, he was out there fasting which we know, according to Scripture, is to draw close to God, to receive from the Lord, to deny himself that bodily sense of taste and, and, and food so that he could direct all his focus and attention on the Father. I, know, I no doubt believe with all my heart that when he was out there, he was seeking the Lord, uh, the Father, about the ministry that he was about to undertake. And if from a bird's eye view of looking in the Bible, we do know that this event takes place before the three and a half years of ministry that he goes around to all of uh, Jerusalem, Judea, Galilee, and then he goes to the cross. So I do believe that he's out there for 40 days, which is over a month, just you know, seeking the Father out about the ministry, about his calling, the Son of God, what he's going to do, going to the cross. Uh, well, we're going to cover it all as we go through Matthew, how often he tells his disciples and others why he came, that he came to die on the cross for mankind's sins. So I do believe that out in the wilderness, why he fasted and was drawing close to the Father, that the Father was revealing to him his plans and purposes. And again, the Spirit is with him. Some people make this mistake that Jesus is just by himself. That's just him and the devil. It's not just him and the devil out in the wilderness. He has a Spirit with him. He's not alone. And the Spirit is a part of the Trinity the, the triune nature of God, and the Holy Spirit has a role to play. And you'll see the Spirit move and help Jesus in these attacks that Satan uh, brings against Jesus. Now, afterward, he became hungry. So you guys can do your own researches. I try to do mine as best as I could. I was looking at healthline.com, like webmd.com. I was looking at other doctors and stuff like that, that... Most doctors will say that if you go without food for four to five days, your hunger goes away. And, you know, I've done keto diet before, and that's not fasting, but my hunger never went away. I was always hungry. <laughs> now, I did read something, like my pastor from Idaho, I was listening to him teach, and he said not by choice, but he went without food for 14 days one time because he made some poor choices in his life. And he's like, I was starving every single day. Like, all, all, every, 14, every day up to day 14, I was starving. So he's like, when, they, when the doctors or they say, whoever they are, that, that you lose your hunger after four or five days, he's like, it wasn't true for him. But we do know that, what I do know, because I was doing keto and then I was researching this, if you go long periods of time without eating food, it's kind of like keto diet where your body's going to start eating itself. 
It's going to eat all your fat, and it's going to rely on uh, ketosis and your ketones for your brain function. And once all that's gone, it's going to start feeding off your, your proteins. Uh, your body's going to eat your muscles, and then it's going to start eating your organs and your heart. And usually when someone dies of starvation, it's usually because of a heart attack, some kind of heart arrhythmia, heart, uh, heart attack. Um, or some kind of infection because your, your immune system becomes so weak. And so we really, when we, when we see Jesus here for 40 days and not eating, he's seeking out the Lord, he's very weak at this moment. You know, he's fully human. He's fully God, but he's fully human, very weak, fatigued. Uh, most people believe his hair probably could have been starting to fall out. Uh, you know, even his skin becoming flaky, his belly being bloated. I mean, he's very weak right now at this moment. And it's interesting that it says after the 40 days is verse 3, when the tempter, the devil, came to him and said, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become bread. So it's, you know, this is no new thing that scripture is revealing to us, but it is a truth that Satan is watching us. First Peter 5, 8 says that the devil is walking around on this earth you know, seeking whom he may devour. And it's no new thing that Satan tries to find us at our weakest moment. And Jesus is definitely weak, humanly speaking, in this moment. He's frail. And he knows that Jesus is hungry. He knows that. And he knows that Jesus needs to eat, otherwise he's about to die. And see, I believe that Jesus is trusting on the Father for his provision. He's waiting upon the Lord to break the fast so that then he can eat. And we'll cover that in verse 11. It's the verse of the week when the angels come and minister to him, which I also believe it's possible they could have gave him manna for food later on. We'll we'll talk about that. But the tempter, the devil, comes on the scene and says, if you are the Son of God, the language in the Greek is actually, since you are the Son of God. This is the declaration at the baptism when the Father said, this is my Son in whom I'm well pleased. You have Satan here saying, well, since you are the Son of God, just take these stones that are all around you. Israel is a lot like Arizona, just a lot of rocks everywhere. And I was listening to John Corson, and John Corson, I haven't been to Israel, Denise has been there, Charlie's been there, some of you have been there. But John Corson was saying, you know, there's actually a lot of rocks over there that are kind of flat and kind of look like a loaf of bread. And so it's very possible that Jesus is looking around and even kind of imagining like these rocks being food. I mean, he was just like us. He was human. He was, he was probably fantasizing about food and, and just thinking about it. There was actually a study done by Minnesota, uh, call it the, the University of Minnesota, 1944 during World War II, where they, they took about 33 guys and, and went through a starving uh, observation. You can't do that. It's not ethical to do that in our country anymore. But they watched these 33 guys starve, and they began to imagine like food and just talk about food. And, and they would be given a little bit of food, and they would cut up in little pieces and try to fill the whole plate up because then it looked like more food. And they became super obsessed with food because they withheld it from them. So it's possible that Jesus was looking Looking at the stones, some, some teachers, some scholars bring that up, that, you know, he could have been thinking about hunger. He was hungry. And Satan comes in, well, you are God. You are the Son of God. Just tell these stones to become, to become bread. So what is the temptation here from Satan? Because eating's not, eating bread's not, if Jesus would have ate bread, that's not sin. The temptation here is that he's asking Jesus, use your God powers. Like, you have the ability. Don't, you know, no one's looking. No one's watching. No one's watching. No one's around. You are God. You are the Son of God. Just break, just break out of your human nature and use your divinity. Use your divine nature to overcome your human need. Like, you have the ability to do that. Which, there's two things. Number one, that's not trusting the Father to provide for him. So he's basically asking Jesus, don't trust in the Father. Don't trust in the fast. Break your fast. It's, you can break your fast now, because that's what he's asking Jesus to do. Break your fast. Don't trust the Father. And number two, don't identify with you and I. Because guess what? When, I, when I'm being tempted, I don't have divine powers to just snap the finger and overcome my my human nature. You and I don't have that. That's cheating. Satan's asking Jesus to cheat and use his God code. <laughs> That's what you use in the video, uh, video game, God mode. Use your God mode to overcome your human need. And, 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 and that's, a, that's a pretty big temptation. That, that, you know what that, that tells us? Because Hebrews tells us he was tempted. That means that there was a part of Jesus that thought about that. He was human. But he doesn't succumb to that because in verse 4, he, Jesus answers. And he's very weak. 
in this moment. By the way, people that are this far along into starvation uh, usually have lack of concentration. Even some people say hallucinations. Uh, it's very hard for them just to stay, you know, on on course, like with a conversation or anything. But Jesus answers and says, it is written, man should not live on bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So the spirit is with Jesus. The spirit led him out there. Now, Jesus tells us in John chapter 14, 15, and 16, the role of the Holy Spirit. And the role, one of the roles of the Holy Spirit is to bring to remembrance the Bible to us, the scriptures. You guys know that. And to lead us into all truth. And I believe that the spirit here empowering Jesus uh, which is not, I mean, he did that. Luke actually says that Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit in Luke chapter 4. So the, the Spirit brings to remembrance to Jesus, it is written. And so Jesus goes to Deuteronomy and points Satan to the Word. So we know that Jesus uses the Word of God for his defense and offense when he's dealing with the demonic. God says that we shouldn't just live on food, the, the physical, the material, but that every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And see, Satan doesn't understand that because he fell from heaven. He's not concerned about Yahweh. He's concerned about himself. I will be like the Most High. He's not concerned about Jehovah. Jesus is the Son of God, and he's not here. His mission isn't just to come here and just, you know, benefit himself. He's out here in the wilderness, in the context that we're reading. He's out here in the wilderness to seek out the Lord. He's fasting, drawing close to the Father, revealing the mission plans, because he's about to go to the cross and save mankind from their sins and rise again on the third day. So life isn't just about the material. It's about the spiritual. And he points Satan to the word of God that I'm going to feed on that. I'm going to feed on the word, God's word. And so that's where I'm going to remain. I'm not going to turn those stones into bread. I, I like bread. I, I've told some of my friends and family members that I think I would rather have, if you, if you offered me French fries or sourdough toast with some butter on it, with a little bit of salt on it, like I would take the sourdough bread. Like I just love that. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus is hungry and he overcomes a temptation by the power of the Spirit using the Word of God. Job, chapter 23, verse 12, Job says, Job has actually a lot of good verses, a lot. I mean, he says a lot of great wisdom. Job, chapter 23, verse 12 says that Job esteemed God's Word more than his necessary food. And I like that. It's like the same thing Jesus is saying. I consider God's word and who God is more important than my physical needs. That's Job 23, verse 12. God's word is perfect, holy, and true. It's complete, and it satisfies the human soul eternally. And Jesus is not going to break his fast. He's not going to not trust in the Father. He is not going to not identify with you and I. Because again, you and I cannot turn on God mode and overcome our temptations. We can't do that. And he could, but he chose not to so that he could sympathize with us. The author of Hebrews says that he did that so he could help us. So he, he, the, Hebrew, the author in Hebrews says that so he could aid us, he could aid us in our temptations. So verse 5, it says, Then the devil took him up into the holy city, this is Jerusalem, to set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, or since you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written... He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. By the way, no, no teacher that I listened to or, or read uh, wanted to publicly speculate, like, what, it, what form did Satan reveal himself to Jesus? It just says that the devil came to him, and he's interacting with Jesus. Uh, was it a snake out in the wilderness? Like you see in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 2 and 3, uh, was it just, you know, did he just appear in his angelic form? Uh, did he possess some guy out there and, and was talking to Jesus? Was he invisible to Jesus at this moment, being fully man? We don't know. We just know that the devil's there. And here's something else that no one really wants to speculate. This is like campfire talk, so just pretend we're like sitting by a fire right now talking about this stuff. Uh, did some people wonder, like, did the devil just transport Jesus, Jesus to the top of the temple? Because he's super tired and weak. It's been 40 days. Me and my wife, we were on keto diet for a month, and we were trying to do some weeding in my front yard. 
And like after 10 minutes, we were both like huffing and puffing and had to stop and had to like re-research keto because we're like, we're doing something wrong. I, I, couldn't, I, cu I couldn't work out. I couldn't play softball when I was on keto. And I was eating food. I was just not eating carbs at all. So it would have been a huge feat just for Jesus to physically walk into Jerusalem, to get on the Temple Mount, and then to get onto the Temple. I mean, are people going to ask questions? Like, do people interact with Jesus? Like, hey, how's it going? Who's that with you? Um, we don't know. Was he transported there? Did they actually physically walk there? We're going to see that he took them to a high mountain too. And that's another huge feat if they actually walked and hiked on top of the mountain. I don't know. I don't think anyone knows. We'll find out someday because the Bible doesn't reveal it to us. All we know is that the devil does take him there to Jerusalem. Was it a vision? You know, I, he takes him up. It makes it seem like this is literal because he's asking him to throw himself down. The pinnacle of the temple is about 200 feet from the top to the bottom. So no doubt, 200 feet, you jump. If you hit the ground, you're going to die. Uh, but Jesus, Satan says, but you're the son of God. Since you're the son of God, throw yourself down because it is written. So you see that Satan is going to play what he thinks is Jesus' game. Jesus responded to Satan the first time by using the word of God. And so now Satan says, well, if you want to use the word of God, Psalm 91, verse 11 and 12 says, he shall give his angels charge over you. So just jump, just jump. What a great spectacle that will be, a public declaration that you're the son of God. Everyone will know, everyone will see it. You'll have a great reward. Like everyone will know that you're the son of God. Like reveal yourself now. Even the word of God, which you like to quote, says that he'll give his angels over you. He won't let you hit the ground. But Satan didn't quote the full verse, if you read it. Psalm 91, verse 11 and 12. And that's interesting about Satan, because he knows God's word, and he twists it. He leaves out big portions of it. And so that's why it's very important for us, as Jesus has already said, that we live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Every word. We don't leave any of it out. And that's why we're convicted at this church, which you probably have figured out, that me and Charlie, like, you know, we definitely have this, like, passion about we want to read every word. And that means even the names and Chronicles and Ezra. Like, we have this conviction that we want to read it all, that God has inspired all of his word, not just some of it, but all of it. And Satan, he tries to take little bits, of, little bits of the word here and there and piece things together and make them say things that don't say it. Like he's doing right here. He's taking the word of God out of context, and he's actually asking Jesus to tempt God, to put God to the test to see if that, you know, that he will do what Satan wants him to do, to publicly show that he is the Messiah at this time. And, and as we continue to read, you'll see that the, only, that the main pinnacle that Jesus wants to reveal to the world who he is, is the event at the cross when he dies for you and I, for our sins. That's when it is his time to publicly declare to everyone like, you know, who he is. So Jesus says to him in verse 7, it is written, yes, the word of God says, you shall not tempt the Lord your God, Deuteronomy. He goes back to Deuteronomy chapter 6 and says it's written in the law of Moses that we're not to test God. I'm not going to do that. You're asking me to step out on the freeway and be like, God, if you're real, like you won't let me get hit. That's just foolish. We're not supposed to do that. I used, when I was younger and single, I used to be in my front yard shooting basketballs. I'd be like, Lord, if it's your will, like I'm going to make this shot and Naomi's going to be my wife. You know, I used to do weird stuff like that. You don't want to do that. So me and Dustin, the worship leader, we were witnessing to some Mormons, Mormon missionaries, for about a month and a half. And we had this great conversation with them. And we, after, the rest, after we met them from the restaurant, we came back here, and we're all excited. We're about to leave. We're re-talking re re about like, what we just went through. And Dustin's picking up rocks, and he's just chucking them out in the parking lot, trying to hit these like, uh, stakes in the ground out there. And this one's like about 70 yards away. And he's like, and I was like, hey, so he, he doesn't throw it. I was like, if you hit that pole, I was like, Mormonism's real. <laughs> and uh, I'm just being stupid. And, like, and so he just like chucks it and it's like, ting. I was like, so we we're like, man, we're idiots. Like, what are we doing? Sorry, Lord. Um, <laughs> um, you don't want to test or tempt the Lord, your God. And Jesus fully God, fully man, the Spirit again empowering him, coming alongside him, 
pointing him to the word to, to be his defense and offense. I'm not going to tempt God. I, he's already declared that I am the Son of God. I don't need to jump off to prove that. He's going to prove that through my life, and especially when Jesus goes to the cross, it's going to show the whole world into the future, like even to now, 2020, and we still look to Jesus on the cross. So he says, I'm not going to tempt the Lord your, uh, the Lord your God. Verse 8, again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you would just fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. Then the devil left him and behold, angels came and ministered to him. So I, I wrote in my Bible that Satan is just swinging for the fences right here. Because when I, this last temptation, taking him up on a high mountain and show him all the cities, all the kingdoms, and saying, like, if you just worship me right now, if you just bow down to me, I'll give you all the fame, I'll give you all the popularity. I, I, like, Satan knows what Jesus knows, that all things have already been given to Jesus. Like, Jesus is God. He is going to assume the, he is the king of kings. He is going to rule and reign on this earth. This is all Jesus. And here Satan is offering it here and now. I'll give it to you now. You don't have to wait. It's, it's a lack of patience that he's, that he's wanting Jesus to... He want, he's playing on Jesus' patience. Like you can have it now. Like you don't have to wait. The temporal pleasure and satisfaction of being king. All you have to do is worship me. I mean, this is a shot in the dark. This is like swinging for the fences from Satan. This is a Hail Mary that doesn't work. And, say, and Jesus is like, just get away. Like, he, he uses the word of God again. He goes back to Deuteronomy and says, you, it's, it is written. So Jesus is consistent with his defense and offense against Satan. And he goes to the word of God again a third time and says, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God in him only. I'm not deviating from that. You want me to. Satan is trying to divide Jesus right here, divide and conquer. It's, it's, it's Satan's tactic to do that, to divide and to conquer. And if he could get Jesus to do this, can you imagine if Jesus would have? I mean, if this was a temptation, a true genuine temptation, that means that Jesus actually thought about it and, and felt that, that inner pull, that, that, that luring of like, man, that is attractive. And he doesn't deny that Satan has the authority to give him a kingdom now on earth. He doesn't deny that. Uh, Paul the Apostle actually says in his epistle that Satan is the god of this world right now. And he was defeated at the cross. But Jesus is saying, just get away. I'm going to worship the Lord. I mean, here he's emboldened, empowered by the Spirit, and he's saying, you know the Word of God, and I'm sticking to it. I'm not deviating from that. And then he says, just get away. And he does. And, and the devil leaves him. He has to leave. The devil left him. In the other Gospels, it says that he leaves him for a more opportune time to come back and tempt him again later. And it says, Behold, angels came and ministered to him. The threefold message from Satan. The threefold message from Satan is, don't trust in God. Take matters into your own hands. Turn, that, turn those stones into bread. Break your fast. Don't trust in God. Who knows if God's going to provide for you? Like, are you going to be out here 40 days, 45 days, 50 more days? You've been out here a long time, Jesus. Like, you're hungry. Use your God mode to overcome your humanly, you know, temptation. Don't trust God. Take matters into your own hands. God won't protect you. Destroy yourself. That's a message of Satan. The second part of his message is destroy yourself. Cast her down from the temple. And the third thing that Satan's message is, is I'll give you this world. Don't follow God. Don't, don't follow your father's plans. I know the father's been out here uh, teaching you and, and, and giving you direction and insight about the ministry, the direction that he wants you to go. But just bow down to me and I'll give you the world. That's the message of Satan is don't trust God. He wants to destroy you and he just wants you to focus on the pleasures of this world. That's what, the, that's what Satan has to offer. The threefold message that comes from God, John the Baptist has already revealed to us, and Jesus will again confirm and affirm it in verse 17 of this chapter, and that is repent, turn away from your sins, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and the wrath of God is coming. <laughs> That's the third threefold message that John and Jesus preach. 
that we need, we need to repent and turn to him. So the, these angels come and they minister him. Uh, Jesus was fully submitted to the Father, submitted to the word of God. I don't think this was easy for him because he was fully God, fully man. But he kind of lives out what his brother writes about in James chapter 4, verse 7. His brother wrote in James that if we submit to God and resist the devil, he will flee from you. And you see that Jesus does that. Like he 100% is submitted to the Father and the Word, and he resisted the devil through the Word of God, and he fled. So Jesus is the overcomer. He is the Son of God. He overcame evil. He's overcome temptation. He can identify with you and I and our temptations. Angels came to him. We know in Hebrews chapter 1 that the roles of angels are ministering spirits. And they came and they ministered. I do believe this means they administered food and warmth and comfort to him. When I was reading on starvation again, you can't just go get a Big Mac or start eating a Chipotle burrito uh, after you don't eat for like 20 or 30 days. Uh, it is actually can do a lot of damage to your organs by if you, just, if you just try to eat normal food after you go that long a period of time without eating food. Um, from what I was reading on Healthline.com, that was like the main uh, source I was looking at. Like you have to be watched by a doctor. If you've, if people, when they find people in other countries that have gone through forced starvations and, and even World War II, uh, some of the Russians and stuff that were starving, the Auschwitz, the Jews that were in concentration camps, uh, when they re-administered food into their bodies, it was under the care of nurses and doctors to watch them and help them. And I mean, it kind of started off as like, you know, liquids with, you know, uh, vitamins and just very, you know, not, not heavy-weighted foods. And, and so Jesus, I do, I look at right here that this, again, shows you his humanity that he had to be ministered to. I mean, he had to be served here in this moment by angels to help him to recoup what he had just gone through physically and spiritually with the devil. I mean, this is just a fascinating story um, that I can't wait to get to heaven and just find out even more insights. But as we're closing, 11-11, I mean, we want to champion Jesus in this chapter. He's the overcomer. He's the one that has identified with you and I so that when you're tempted and I'm tempted and I'm tempted every single day in so many areas of my life that I can go to Jesus without embarrassment because the Hebrew author said that we can come boldly to the throne of grace because we know that we have a high priest that sympathizes with us in our weaknesses because at all points he was tempted like you and I. And so we can come boldly. We don't have to be nervous or embarrassed about our temptations. Jesus actually said in Matthew chapter 6, when we get there, in the model prayer, that when we pray to the Father, that we should say, lead us not into our temptation. So I actually believe that we should be so open and honest in our prayer life that we should reveal, because God already knows our temptations, that we should talk about our temptations with the Lord and look by the power of His Holy Spirit and His Word to overcome our temptations. Not all temptations are necessarily sinful, I'm trying to diet and my daughters make brownies all the time. And I'm like, and I get upset at my wife because I'm like, Naomi, we just talked about this. I want olives, I want eggs, I want, I want healthy stuff. She's like, don't eat it. <laughs> well, like, and the temptation is like, okay, I won't do it. Two hours later, and I'm like, I can have one. I can have one. One's not that big. I'm under my calories and I'm supposed to be right now. I can have one. But I know myself. I'll have two. And I'll have three. And then I'll be like, and by that time, I'll be like, well, you know what? I'll just start tomorrow again. <laughs> right? The, the temptation is just, it's, we have it within ourselves. It's, temptation isn't always necessarily bad. Um, there's good temptations, bad temptations. But yeah, we just want to trust in the Lord. In verse 12, it says, when Jesus heard that John had been put into prison, he departed to Galilee. John, we'll, we'll, we'll talk more about that story later on. John was quite a character. Um, Jesus said he's the greatest prophet who ever lived. And man, he was bold. I mean, he confronted the leaders of Jerusalem about some sin. And John gets thrown in prison. He departed to Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum. We're going to read a lot about Capernaum. It's a great place of ministry that Jesus did. I've never been to Israel. I, I've gone there on the virtual headset, Oculus, and it looks pretty neat. 
Um, but we'll talk more about that city, which is by the sea in the regions of Zebulon and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, the land of Zebulon, the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness had seen a great light, and upon those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. Jesus has come. He is the fulfiller of the word of God. He is the Messiah. He's the one who is the light. John, the Gospel of John says, John the Baptist came bearing witness of the light, but he wasn't the light that brings light into the world. It was Jesus. And in verse 17, it says, From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so that's where I want to, I want to leave it this morning, is that Satan comes to tell you not to trust in God, take matters in your own hands, he wants to destroy you, so you got to know that. Like, Satan has got nothing good for you except wanting to take you down. And number three, he just wants you to focus on the material, all, of, all, of, all that the world has to offer. Jesus says, I've come to give you life and peace. Because when Jesus says, repent, he's saying, turn from your ideologies that are not God and turn them towards the one true God. Repent of your sins. Confess your sins. Repent means to turn around. It's the metaneo Greek word that just do a 180. You know, here we are in wintertime with no snow in Arizona except in the mountains. But if you were like snowboarding, you want to do a cool trick, you do like a 180 like up in the, like on a jump. But you got to do a 180 in your, in your soul. You know, you need to turn around from the path of hell and destruction and turn it towards Jesus, which is life more abundantly. Why? Because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And almost all Christians that I talk to today believe that the kingdom of heaven is very at hand, uh, especially what's going on in our current day situation. But you know what? I'm 40 years old and it seems like every year I'm getting older and <laughs> I'm getting closer and closer to that day that the Lord just calls me home. So, so heaven is close. I mean, our lives are short. They're a vapor. We're here, we're here a second, gone a second. So Jesus is preaching like we need to turn towards God. We need to repent. We need to get right. He wants to offer life to us where Satan offers up death and destruction and false hope. And so next week, We'll talk about the calling of the Peter, James, and John, the disciples. We'll get into that. I definitely encourage you to dive more into that temptation. There's so much to look at that I didn't even get to cover this morning because I know I'm under time restraints. So let's pray. If anyone needs prayer, um, I'm more than available to pray with you. I know Charlie is. I know the elders are. If you're watching online and you need prayer, you could just drop us a Facebook message or you could email me, chris at ajcalvary.com. Um, but yeah, prayer is so important. So let's, let's pray now. Lord, I just thank you for this morning, God. I thank you for your word and just how much you relied on your own word. Lord, we know that you are the son of God and that you could have went toe to toe with Satan. You could have just cast him out of your presence immediately. I mean, you could have just snapped your fingers and he, he could have not existed anymore, but you chose your own living word. That's infallible. That's perfect without error. You used your own word, Lord, to contend with him, Lord. And we saw that your word put it, you know, stopped him, stopped him in his tracks. It quieted him, Lord. So I pray right now, Lord, that all of us in this room watching online, Lord, that when we feel the attacks of the enemy, Lord, that we would turn towards, turn towards your word, that we would turn towards you, that we would rely on your spirit as we see you did in the wilderness. Help us to rely on your word as much as you did, God, that you weren't just a hearer of the word, but you were a doer, that you submitted to the Father. You resisted the devil. Lord, I pray that if there's anyone in this room that's struggling with the demonic, Lord, I pray that they would submit to you, resist the devil, and that they would flee from any individual that feels that they're being harassed right now. But God, we thank you that you're the overcomer, that you are the victor. You are the King of Kings, and we, we definitely see that you're championed in this chapter, and, and we love you. We adore you. Uh, just fill us with your spirit. We desire to walk like you walk, God. So we, we love you, Jesus, and we pray this in your name. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a good morning.